Góðan dag og velkomin í annan fyrirlestur á misserunni. Afsakarna rugling með staðsynningu fyrirlestarins. Við munum mæti vera í þessum sal en ekki á þjóðmennisafninu í ár. Nú hún Lúna Pólkulínalli hjá Háskóli Íslands ætlar að kynna hluta af doktorsrannsun sinni í dag sem snýst um báta á Disneysi. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Rua Morinelli. I'm a PhD student in archaeology here at the University of Iceland under the supervision of Orri Vestensen. Um, my uh, project focuses in uh, proposing a new method for the identification of boat burials. Um, uh, if you were here last year, you probably uh, watched my fir the first part of my project that was focusing on the state of research uh, of boat burials. And today I can uh, present the, how my project has evolved since then and uh, uh, where it's going forward. So the question my project poses is, is it a boat? How can we know if uh, a boat is present in a Viking Age grave assemblage? The problem is that we really have only a few confirmed boat burials uh, because the uh, only a handful of findings present a wooden structure, like for example, the Oseberg ship, but these are extremely rare. Uh, otherwise, another way to know for sure a boat is present in a burial is to look um, if there is an impression on the soil, because the wood, when it rottens, it leaves a boat shape. And also the iron fasteners, while the, the boat is decaying, they rest on the ground and we can, say the, we can see the shape. But this is not always the case, because sometimes the, these burials have been reopened in antiquity. Uh, or they have been discovered through an accident, like through construction. And so the impression might have been uh, messed up. And also um, the burials which were discovered in the late 1800s or early 1900s are not as thoroughly recorded. Um, they did not, the archeologists back then did not write down whether or not an impression was present. Um, so, it is unreliable to look at those records and know for sure that that's a boat, even though they say so. Um, so what we're left with are the iron fasteners that are the nails, the rivets and the clench bolts. And there has been a lot of debate about this, how many and which type of, of fasteners confirm that that is a boat, even though the wooden structure is missing and the impression is missing. And I've discussed this in my previous talk. We have uh, scholars like Gustafsson in the late 1800s would say any amount of nail is proof of a boat. We have people like Christian Eldian who say that doesn't matter how many nails you get in a burial, that's not proof that that's actually a boat because it could come, you know, the nails could come from some other object. Um, then later on in the 70s, uh, Muller Wille uh, put as a rule of thumb that 100 nails were the limit, let's say that you could say, yes, this is possibly a boat, but this is not really reliable. We have a lot of boats that are confirmed and then have less, uh, and some have way more. And also the scholars did not really focus on which type of fastener we're looking at. Nail, rivet, clench bolt are all treated as one type of fastener, these terms are used interchangeably. And I apologize because probably I will do the same while I talk just because the word clench was so long. But when we look at boat burials, we're always talking about clench bolts. But why is this research so important? Well, because the boat burial custom, there is so much written about it. It's so interesting. Everyone knows about boat burials in the Viking age, even those who do not study this. But how can we really talk about this custom if we don't know its occurrence, location, frequency, what it looks like? 
our idea of boat barrels is severely skewed by the biggest finding, like the Osever ship. And this is not representative of the entire custom. So it is important to find a new method to identify boats in burials so that we can then move on to talk about this custom with a clearer picture in mind. So as I said, when we talk about boat burials and their fasteners, we talk about clench boats, which um, are formed by the head, the shank and the row. The, for those who don't know, it's like this. The head is and the shank are one piece and they're driven through the planks to bind them together. Then a rove is placed on the other side and the point of the shank is hammered down to secure the, this clench bolt to the, to the plank so that the planks are bound together. But of course, this is very rare that we get to find something like this complete. Um, most often we find just pieces, just parts just the head, just the shank, or just the row. Um, so to analyze the different parts, I divided them by type um, so that you can see these are all finds that I, from this list, um, you can see there can have like a round shape or a rhomboidal or square. Um, the same thing for rows, they can be of different types and the same for shanks. And this will be important as we go on uh, into the analysis of thisness. So why thisness? Why did I choose to start my research with thisness? Because um, it's, uh, it was accessible to me because I was able to go to Theod Minyasaf and analyze every single artifact uh, by myself. It is well recorded because it is a uh, modern discovery just done in like 2017. So uh, every single artifact is recorded, it's coordinates and you can recreate the boat on, uh, on Arcgis. So it really gives you a good sense of where the nails are uh, placed on the, were placed on the ground. Um, Disness is in the north of Iceland, uh, close to Akureyri, and uh, the two Viking Age boat burials were present in a cemetery with other graves, which did not contain um, boats. So they probably looked, these two boats probably looked something like this. They didn't have a mast. Uh, they were seaworthy at some point and had been used probably as fishing vessels. They're not big boats, as we will see. And uh, yes, so you can have an idea of what they probably looked like. Of course, the wooden structure at this point is completely gone. So getting to know them, we have Vera 116, that is a 6.5 meter long boat. Um, fairly well preserved, although it was reopened in antiquity. Um, so it was disturbed in the front, in the bow. Uh, and then it was subjected to erosion in the bow part. So as you can see, part of the front is missing. Overall, it had 544 passengers, of which except for one were all clench bolts. The only one, this exception, it looks like a nail, but it could honestly also be a fishing hook. So uh, the overwhelming majority, as I said, are clench balls. Uh, and the same for barrel 124. It's a six meter long vessel. Uh, its eastern side was severely damaged by erosion, but it didn't show any signs of reopening. And it has 527 clench balls with no exception. I think it's important to notice that although 124 is shorter, by half a meter, it has almost the same amount of clench balls. So I would argue that um, if the barrel was, you know, if the boat was complete, then it would have the same amount or superior amount of clench balls as 116. And I think this is because its planks were probably thicker and needed additional binding, as we will see. So this is how I proceeded. I analyzed every single artifact and divided it by preservation, typology, uh, integrity, and so on. Again, you can see that there is a very similar amount of clench balls. And in percentage, even though 124 suffered the most damage, 
more it has more complete collectibles overall uh, so in, even though it's the one that suffered the most damage it's better preserved um, which is very interesting it's not moving anymore yes here we go so this is how I proceeded. I looked at the two burials. Of course, we're looking at over 500 clench balls per burial. It was, I had to find a way to divide them into sections to proceed into a smaller analysis uh, to begin with. So I have the bow, the fore part, middle part, aft part, and the stern, bow being the front and stern being the back. Um, of course, I know this is not the uh, traditional way in which boats are divided, but when we're facing with such an amount of artifacts, I needed to find a way to go about it. Um, of course, I um, analyzed every single section for each boat and then I compared them, but uh, we don't have time, nor I think it's very interesting to go into detail for every single section. So I will just show you the middle section as a case study for the entire boat. So the middle section, we can see they're fairly similar, um, even though um, Barrel 116 has more than doubled the findings, we can see again that Barrel 124 has a superior level of uh, preservation because 37% uh, of the clenchables are complete uh, against the 27% of Barrel 116. So I think it's very important to keep this in mind that uh, Bear 124 is better preserved, even though a larger part of it is missing. Same thing for uh, integrity. Uh, you can see they are very similar. Uh, and it's just to give you an idea of how I worked uh, with these artifacts. Uh, So here you can see the average length, breadth, and thickness of the clench bolts. Again, you can see they are very similar, these two, uh, these two bolts. So uh, my hypothesis for this section was that the middle section would be the longest of the entire boat. Um, so I looked at the average length for every single section, as you can see in the tab. And uh, you can see that the middle is in fact longer for okay. better 116 because boats naturally become bigger towards the center where the plants are thicker. But as you can see, there, there is this weird uh, unexpected result in the stern of 124, which is kind of puzzling because why would it have its longest clench rolls in the stern? Does not make any sense? Uh, first of all, we have to consider it's only four findings because it was severely damaged. But uh, why is this? Um, so the hypothesis I could come up with is bear 124, a lower quality. They had to, they want to put this boat in the ground. They want to fix it up, but it didn't need to be seaworthy anymore. It was just going in the ground. So maybe they just fix it with whatever object they had at hand. Maybe. Um, the analysis of the wood of the boat showed that it has uh, two different types of wood. So pine and larch. So probably was repaired with drift food. Um, so maybe different types of wood require different size of fasteners. Uh, is it just a fluke? So this is very interesting and puzzling. But that, my assumption is that looking at other boats from other burials will show a pattern similar to burial 116. Uh, although it would be very uh, exciting if instead it was more like 124. So this is something that uh, we will have to see going forward with my analysis. Here you can see the other average lengths, especially. You can see that the two boats are very, very similar. Uh, 181 against 191, it, it's virtually identical, I would say. But so this really gives us an idea of how a boat of this size, 6, 6.5 meters, and each set of its section was built. And we can also see the length of each clench bolt for the sections and how many clench bolts are required. 
um, we see that a smaller boat doesn't necessarily require fewer fasteners um, because the planks can be narrower, as we've seen. And so um, this can give us an idea, as I said, of how a boat of this size is supposed to look like. So if we see that other boats that are this type of length have this type of pattern, then it would be possible to apply this to debatable boat burials. And if we see that it fits the pattern, then it's possible to argue that it is in fact a boat. Um, looking at the typology, uh, the, ty the most common type is the type A, as uh, I've shown in one of the first slides, uh, with very, very few instances of other types. Why is this? I, I wondered. Um, can it be that why it was it, they were all type A and while they were decaying, they just warped into another shape? Could it be human error? I mean, every single clench bolt is made by hand. So maybe some were not as accurate as the others. But especially why is this important? Because if they're all the same, which it means that they were made with a, with a certain style in mind. And it means that whoever was building this boat had the same ideas, the same patterns, the same technique to build these boats. Uh, and we can see because uh, the two boats are so, so close to each other, so similar. They have an average length of all the complete clench boats is basically the same. The standard deviation shows that their range is really, really similar as well. So I, I feel like it's really possible to argue that either we can say the same hand build the two boats, but I don't think this is likely, or that the two boats were built with the same techniques and with the same style in mind. And so this will be very interesting going forward in this analysis mm -hmm. to see if other confirmed boat burials fit in uh, the same pattern as shown by the two boat burials of this nest. So what's next is to look at other confirmed boat burials, as I just said, create databases like the one I did for this nest uh, and perform a, a similar analysis. Once I have analyzed enough boats, then I have a more secure pattern and I can start analyzing debatable boat burials to see whether or not the method stands and works. Uh, and after that, uh, once the corpus is reevaluated, then we can move on and analyze the custom with more sureness. So thank you so much for being here today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Are you